This is Thought in Motion, Movie Edition. Today's video examines the 2021 film Encanto. Lacan is notoriously difficult to understand and attempts to summarize and explain his ideas in a more approachable language still present significant barriers. So I wish to do something a little different today to apply some of his central concepts to a film. The story features the Madrigal family whose members are blessed with unique magic gifts and who live in an enchanted home or casita within a fictional town in Colombia. In this video, I'll analyze this film drawing upon Lacanian concepts, especially those thus far covered in my Thought in Motion series. As a warning, there will be spoilers if you haven't already watched the film Encanto. The Madrigal family's magical powers begin in tragedy, resulting from the father figure's death shortly following the birth of his three children who he had with a woman named Alma. In the present day of the film, Alma is the matriarch of the Madrigal household and grandmother or abuela to the film's central protagonist, Maribel. The father's death is significant as through it certain powers are bestowed upon the family. Consequently, the father lives on symbolically through the candle that is the source of the family's magic, as well as through the discourse and authority of Abuela Alma. Trauma is a central concept in Lacanian thought and is the fundamental wound around which the psyche operates. It marks the intrusion of the real and resists being directly spoken of or experienced. It's impossible to imagine and serves as the object of anxiety. Though resistant to symbolization, it's still assigned a signifier that must then be repressed and detached from the larger chain of signifiers that establishes the subject and its world. The signifier is what Freud called the unconscious thought. In this sense, the psyche is analogous to a top secret document declassified and made public but containing redacted information. The document can still be read and delivers a kind of understanding, but the redacted information creates gaps in knowledge that tacitly exert an influence on the rest of the text in ways unknown to the reader. There are elements of the explicit content that implicitly relies on and is governed by the redacted information. This is like how the repressed signifier functions in psychic life. Before discussing this repressed signifier in the film, let's consider what would be equivalent to the governmental agency censoring such information. In Encanto, this figure is represented by Abuela Alma. She's the one who carries on the name of the father through her own speech but in such a manner that becomes oppressive, making Abuela Alma a figure of the superego. Rather than being a pillar of a positive morality, the superego is a ferocious figure linked to an earlier traumatic event that pushes an element of the law to the foreground, expressing itself as a kind of senseless, repressive force. Although the superego functions as an imperative related to the law, its fundamental commandment is to enjoy that we must enjoy our symptoms, and in this case, the symptoms of the magical powers exhibited by Abuela Alma's children and grandchildren. Another essential concept is the Big Other. The Big Other is the symbolic order itself, or more accurately, the law that governs it. In the film, the Big Other is instantiated by Abuela Alma in her function of superego, but let's be clear that the Big Other is not Abuela Alma herself, but the symbolic father who functions in a misrecognized form through her. An important point that Lacan develops in later seminars is that the Big Other lacks. That the Big Other is not the perfect being it appears to be, but is itself incomplete. In the film, we can see that outside of Mirabel, Abuela Alma is the only one who does not have a gift. She supports the structure of the gift with the law without having one herself. It's also the case as Mirabel overhears Abuela Alma speaking that she recognizes that everything is falling apart, that the magic is going away. This insight into the lack of the Big Other propels Mary Bell to search for the repressed signifier, a search that leads her to her uncle Bruno. As already mentioned, the original trauma 
though itself inexpressible, gets assigned a signifier that is both detached from the rest of the signifying chain and repressed by the oppressive superego. This repressed signifier, the unconscious subject, is represented by Bruno, who lives within the walls of Casita. It's appropriate for him to be portrayed as living in the walls rather than, say, underground. The unconscious is not a basement cut off from the rest of the home, but rather unconsciousness permeates throughout. In psychoanalysis, the unconscious is located in speech itself, not in the empty speech of everyday conversation, but in the errors, slips, and pauses that pervade our everyday speech. Why is Bruno isolated from the rest of the family? Overtly, it's due to his gift for predicting the future and being the harbinger of bad news. He becomes an unwelcomed and disruptive force to the rest of the family. However, I don't think it's entirely a coincidence that the only son of the triplets is the one to be repressed. As the only identified male child of the father, he represents the father in a manner that is, in a sense, too close to the original trauma. This outcast is the repulsive abject who keeps returning in speech through verbal negations, which Freud called Verneinung and is exhibited in the song We Don't Talk About Bruno. Now, what is the fatal premonition that ultimately leads him to separate from the rest of the family? It's the repetition of trauma. The father's death represented the origin of the symptomatic reconfiguration of psychic life and will return in the destruction of Casita and the loss of the family's gifts. It's not an exact reproduction of the original event, but a repetition of the original act of failure that seeks out new forms and new actors through which to repeat itself for the sake of seeking recognition. And so we discover here the death drive itself. The death drive is this compulsive recirculation of the repressed signifier that, through a repetitive insistence, aims to create the original conditions of failure. In many other forms of psychology, the ego is presented as the center of psychic life, a critical dimension of healthy and adaptive relating to the world. However, Lacan places it at the center of symptomatic difficulties for the subject. The ego is the misrecognized portion of that subject. It's an alienated identification, one that is affirmed as the entirety of psychic life itself, and so is the seat of resistance to recognizing the unconscious. The gifted characters in Encanto can be interpreted as representing various ego identifications. First, there are the children of Alma, the two siblings of Bruno, Peppa, who has the power to create weather, often pertaining to her moods, representing the ego's affective dimension, and Julieta, Mirabel's mom, who has the gift of healing, and who I'll speak about a little bit more shortly. The children of Peppa are Camilo, who has the power of changing his appearance to whomever he meets, representing the mirroring of the ego. Dolores, who has the gift of super hearing, but who, like the ego, only hears the overt discourse and never the unconscious discourse. And Antonio, who in the film acquires the gift of communicating with animals, representing the ego's connection to the animal world. The children of Julieta include Luisa, who has superhuman strength, representing the manner in which the ego attempts to hide the subject's cracks in putting forth an image of strength and wholeness, but also in its immense capacity to resist the unconscious, and Isabella, who is presented as the perfect one and has to get the creating plant life, representing the ideal ego and exemplar of narcissistic captation. Luisa and Isabella are the sisters of Mirabel, who is the normal one, that is, the one without a gift, and who, like Bruno, is somewhat of an outcast, but remains part of the family, thereby representing the alienating characteristic of the ego. The imaginary fashions a false reality, which is nonetheless the reality we think is real. It's the location of narcissistic fantasies of being exceptional, unique, and powerful. What prevents Mirabel from falling into despair over her lack of gifts is her identification with her perfect family. For a while, at least, this fanciful reality covers over the gaps of knowledge, offering a seemingly seamless, integrated reality until it can no longer hold. Casita is the representative of this integrated body. It is the ego as fully unified. Mirabel's mother, Julieta, possesses, as already mentioned, a magical gift, the power to heal. However, 
As another mother figure, she holds a position within psychic life not unlike Abuela Alma. Is she then the imaginary mother, whereas Abuela Alma is the symbolic mother? Or is she something else? Perhaps she best reflects what is called the ego ideal. Unlike the ideal ego, who is an imaginary misrecognition, the ego ideal operates at the level of the symbolic, but instead of functioning as a sensor or agent of repression, exerts pressure towards sublimation. She is a kind of secondary identification that allows the family's wounds not to completely fester and destroy the home, but transforms them into a productive energy, hence her gift for healing. As the primary ego identification, Mirabelle begins to find cracks and becomes anxious in approaching the repressed signifier. However, it's not until the ego goes to where the id is located that the truth begins to be more fully disclosed. This would converge with Lacan's interpretation of Freud's statement that where the id is, there the ego shall be. And Lacan seems to equate the id with the unconscious subject. Upon entering Bruno's cavernous room, Mirabelle discovers a mirror image of herself with the house in the background. But the image is fractured, both the glass it is made of and the image of the house in the mirror. And once Casita actually begins to fall apart, once the cracks within the home show themselves, the home Casita is revealed as the fragmented body it always already was. Like in a dream in which the imaginary unity dissolves into the fragmented multiplicity of ego identifications, the Madrigal home begins to show the fractured truth of its imagined unity, thereby disclosing the divided subject. Later in her pursuit of answers and upon encountering Bruno, more is revealed. However, as the ego often does, it continues to misrecognize this truth. The initial interpretation of Bruno's latest vision is that a reconciliation is needed between her and her perfect sister, Isabella. However, rather than accomplish a proper resolution, the actions of Mirabelle and Isabella elicit the wrath of the superego, Abuela Alma. And it is this final confrontation that leads to the collapse of Casita and loss of magic. The superego's demands upon the ego become too much, and the imaginary edifice of psychic life collapses. However, this event also opens the possibility for a fundamental reconstruction of the subject's history in such a manner that will allow for more to be recognized than before. Or at least that is what probably should have happened. From all this, we can perhaps offer some considerations as to which clinical structure is being represented in this film. Is it a neurotic or psychotic structure? I would say neurotic. The big other seems to be present and generally functioning, operating as a quilting point that knits together the Madrigal family. The primordial signifier of the symbolic father has been affirmed, and defenses against the repressed signifier are marked by negation rather than the kind of refusal found in psychosis. Next, we can consider whether the neurosis at play here is closer to an obsessive or hysteric position. I'm inclined to consider the film portraying a hysteric neurosis for the following reasons. First, there is the preoccupation with the fragmented body, and this body figures more centrally in hysteria through the expression of physical symptoms. In hysteria, the return of the repressed happens in the body more so than it does in thought, which is more characteristic of the return of the repressed in obsessional neurosis. Second, there is a fundamental question being asked that is more consistent with the structure of hysteria. Both obsessive and hysteric neurosis are organized around such a question, yet whereas the obsessive's question concerns existence, am I alive or am I dead, the hysteric's question concerns identity, especially one's gendered identity. For Mirabelle, the question may be something like, who am I in this family in light of not having a gift? Third, the fundamental fantasy of becoming the object that fills the lack of the big other is more consistent with hysteria. Mirabelle is constantly attempting to serve her family, be a good daughter, and protect the family from the cracks and loss of magic that threatens it. This would be in contrast to the fundamental fantasy of obsessives, which would entail a desire to possess the object while refusing to recognize its relation to the big other. 
We can see a clear contrast in the film Aladdin where the fundamental fantasy consists of possessing the object, of getting the girl without, at least at first, any regard for Jasmine's subjectivity or her position vis-a-vis -vis the law of the father. In fact, Aladdin attempts to disregard the law through an imaginary wish to become a law unto himself, hence his wish for the genie to make him a prince, thereby covering over his own lack, all for the sake of possessing his object. In light of this, we can ask whether Encanto's resolution is consistent with the aims of psychoanalysis. This is where I think the movie makes the wrong move from a Lacanian perspective. The film ends with a reconciliation between Mirabel and Abuela Alma, and as a kind of secondary outcome, the welcoming back of Bruno into the family. They rebuild the home, and the magic returns. At first, there is some progress made. Psychoanalysis is the reconstruction of the subject's history through a recognition of the repressed signifier. Abuela Alma brings the past trauma into speech at the end of the film, and this part of the healing process allows for some reconstruction and reconciliation. Yet the film retreats from the radicality of a genuine transformation, I think. A possible Lacanian ending would have been where Bruno is reintroduced into explicit discourse, that is, he is now more a part of the family, but the magic is gone. Instead, the ending wanted to have its cake and eat it too. It wanted to preserve the egoic fantasy of magical powers while also recognizing the repressed signifier. Unfortunately, the film does not realize that the magic can only be preserved through the sacrifice of Bruno. We could contrast this with the film Spirited Away, in which the central protagonist's name, Chihiro, is ripped away from her, plunging her into the fanciful world of the bathhouse. Once she manages to recognize her name, along with recognizing her parents, she can then return to her world. But importantly, she leaves the magic behind. The predominance of egoic identifications gives way to symbolic recognition through a transformed reintroduction of the signifier. And so returning to Encanto, not only does the ending feel a little bit unearned in the abrupt resolution of conflict, but the ending perpetuates the refusal to recognize castration, and instead perpetuates the egoic myth that ultimately covers over the gaps and simply rearranges the furniture of egoic identifications in order to preserve the magical thinking of the imaginary. I thought I'd experiment a little bit in this manner of presenting Lacan. I hope this was helpful, maybe providing others an avenue for accessing some of his thought. We'll return to our analysis of Seminar 3 next time. If you found this video helpful and want to see more, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. The link is below in the description. You can also provide support by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. Thank you for watching, and until next time, be well.